great honor and pleasure to present Professor John Hopcroft. He's professor in computer science at Cornell University. His research centers on theoretical aspects of computing, automata theory, and graph algorithms. He has co-authored four books on formal languages and algorithms, regarded as classic books in the field for the last 40 years. As most PhD students, I also studied in his books in the late 70s as a PhD student at the University of Waterloo in Canada. In 1986, he received the Alan Turing Award, the most prestigious award in the field of computing, in this case for fundamental achievements in the design and analysis of algorithms and data structures. Professor Hopcroft is a member of the National Academy of, Science, of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for Advancement of Science, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and the Association for Computing Machinery. From 1992-98, he was appointed by President Bush to the National Science Board, which oversees the National Science Foundation. From 1995 to 98, he served uh, on the National Research Council's Commission on Physical Sciences, Mathematics, and Applications. His most recent work is on the study of information capture and access. He is now working in a new book entitled Foundations of Data Science, which covers the theory needed to model phenomena such as the web and social networks. It could be viewed as the theory for the next 40 years, perhaps. And this book can be downloaded if you go to his homepage, you can download this book. In his talk today, Professor Hopcroft will present the necessary changes required in the academic education for professional success in the information age and give examples of mathematics necessary to strengthen the education that will be required for access to good jobs in the future. Professor John, please. I'd like to thank the Brazilian National Academy of Science for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, my, my views uh, on, on, on the future of, of science. Uh, one of the thing, points I'd like to make is that science is changing and that uh, a time of change is a time of opportunity. And to bring this home, I'm gonna tell you a brief story of my career. Uh, I graduated from Stanford uh, in 1964 in electrical engineering, and I was hired by Princeton University in a department of electrical engineering. There were no computer science departments at that time, but the chair of the department at Princeton understood that computer science was going to be important, and he asked me if I would teach a course in computer science. And I had to ask, well, what does one teach? Because there were no books, uh, there were no such courses. And he gave me four papers and said, if you cover these, uh, it'll be a good course. What I didn't realize was that, okay. Uh, 
what, what I didn't realize was, was uh, teaching this course made me one of the world's first computer scientists. And so whenever our country was looking for a senior computer scientist for a job, I was on the short list. Uh, and, and this is why our, our president asked me when I was in my 40s if I would be on the National Science Board, which oversees basic science funding in the US. And a lot, a lot of people ask me, you know, how did you ever get that job? Imagine if I had been in high energy particle physics. I would still be waiting today for the senior faculty ahead of me to retire. And uh, so the point that I just want to make is that those individuals and institutions and nations uh, who position themselves for the future, uh, there will be tremendous uh, benefits. So I'd like to talk a little bit about my view of science in the 21st century, because it's, uh, the future is going to be in the information sciences and the biological sciences. And I thought what I would do today is just share with you uh, some of the exciting things with, that are happening in the information sciences. And I'm, I'm going to go kind of quickly through these because it's, it's not the technical content, it's just to show you the excitement. And there are just thousands of things that are taking place now, similar to the ones I'm going to show you, but I only have time to show you five, five or six. So uh, I'm just going to focus on just a, a few of these exciting new research directions. So some of the things uh, in the past, sociologists could only study a few hundred uh, humans. But now with the opportunity of looking at social networks, uh, they can study hundreds of millions of, of individuals. Also, there are exciting advances being made in learning theory, uh, in something called deep learning. I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and a number of other things. One thing which is particularly important is in computer science, you're going to deal with high dimensional data. And high dimensions is fundamentally different than the low dimensions that at least formed my in, intuition. So let me start with some social networks. Uh, a social network is, is just a graph and you're given an adjacency matrix. And the vertices of the graph may correspond to people, maybe books, maybe uh, products purchases or genes if it's a biological network. And the edges uh, depend on the type of network, but let's say you had the physics archive. Uh, here the vertices are research papers and there'll be an edge between two vertices if the two papers are on the same topic. And what we would like to do is look at the structure in these networks. So if you were to cluster the physics archive, you would probably end up clustering the papers according to whether they were physics, chemistry, math, or biology. But one of the interesting things is there's a lot more structure there. Um, if you, the, the way a, a paper is represented is by a vector where the coordinates of the vector correspond to words and the value of that coordinate is the number of times that word appears in the document. Now, if, uh, if a document is a survey document, the, the words in it will be different than if it's a research document. And so instead of clustering things according to whether it's physics, chemistry, or biology, you ought to be able to cluster whether it's a survey paper or a research paper. You ought to be able to also cluster whether the author was an English-speaking author or whether it was an Asian author or some other language uh, or whether it was an established author or a young author. And these other ways of clustering, I'm going to call sort of hidden structure, but it's the real structure that you want to find. Uh, for example, if terrorists were using the Facebook to communicate, there would be very little communication, but, but be very important to be able to find that kind of structure. So, um, to give you another example, suppose uh, you wanted to cluster handwritten characters. You'd probably cluster them according to the actual character, but you might want to cluster them according to who wrote the character. Uh, and I'll just show you here, I, I just printed some letters. If you were going to cluster them, you would probably do it by letter. But if you look very carefully at them, some of them are black and some of them are just dark gray. 
and there are three different type fonts. And it's these subtle structures that you want to find in these networks. So uh, I'll talk about discovering hidden structure. And the way this started is it was always known that clustering algorithms worked better on synthetic, synthetically generated data than on real data. And uh, there was a faculty member in, in China who asked why. And, and the reason is, is that in synthetic networks, uh, the person who generates the network adds uncorrelated random noise to make it look like real data. But in real data, what looks like random noise is actually correlated. And it's due to hidden structures. And so she said, well, we ought to be able to find those hidden structures and figure out what's going on. So let, let me give you some examples of some structured data first. Uh, in, in structured data, you, ha you have an adjacency matrix, and you pick a few vertices, and you make a cluster out of them by putting in a large number of edges, and you don't put very many edges out here. So then you do add some random noise, and then you permute the rows and columns, and you give someone the this adjacency matrix, and you ask them to figure out the permutation, which gets you back to here. Okay, now, if you're going to put structure in the network, uh, or hidden structure, you put a dominant structure in, you permute the rows and columns, then you add some more structure, permute the rows and columns again, and you ask people to find uh, both the hidden structure and the dominant structure. Uh, I'll just show you another uh, piece of data. I created an adjacency matrix, and I asked students to find the permutation which would pull out the structure. And a student came into my office very quickly and said, I found it. There are three communities. Uh, all of the edges are in these communities, and there's no edges in between. Do I get an A plus? At that moment, another student came in and said, I found the structure. There, there are five communities. And what I had done is I had put these two structures together and put them in the graph uh, in a hidden way and uh, randomly permuted it. And this is just to give you an example of how complex this is going to be when you deal with uh, real networks. So uh, one of the things that, that this woman did is she created a framework for weakening the dominant structure. And then you can use your favorite algorithm to, to, to cluster, and it allows you to find some of the weaker structures. And it turns out that in some of the real data, we are able to pull out seven levels of, of, of structure. But she had another idea. She said, maybe we can improve existing clustering algorithms. Why don't we find the dominant structure, weaken it, find the hidden structure, and then go back to the original network and weaken the hidden structure. And this improves most of the common clustering algorithms. And I will demonstrate what one of the, how one of the state-of-the-art clustering algorithms works on, on some synthetic data. So we applied, uh, uh, we applied a, a clustering algorithm. The, the big circles up here are what the clustering algorithm gave us. The little circles are the vertices in the graph. And the coloring of the little vertices is the clusters they actually belong in. And, and you can see that this, this algorithm, well, it did sort of a good job. Not, and this is one of the best algorithms in the literature. But when we weakened this dominant structure, what we were then able to do is find some hidden structure. And, and again, the colors of the small uh, vertices are the, what, what cluster they belong in in the hidden structure. But then what she did is she went back and she weakened the hidden structure and reapplied the algorithm to find the dominant structure. And by alternating this, she improved both the dominant and the, the hidden structure. And let me show you that in a different sequence. I'm going to show you the dominant structure after several iterations. So this is, was the first uh, picture. This was after one improvement, another improvement, and another. 
And, and you can see that she significantly improved a state-of-the-art clustering algorithm. Uh, here, here's the hidden structure. It, as you weaken the improved dominant structure, you get a better, better hidden structure, and you can see it works quite well. Now, I know it's in your mind, since I said algorithms always work better on synthetic data, why don't you show us some real data? So, so let, here's some real data. Uh, we took uh, uh, Facebook data for students at Rice, and uh, a state-of-the-art clustering algorithm would give you back a cluster like this. Uh, and I will just go through the steps of what happens as you weaken this, find the hidden, weaken the hidden, and so forth. This is the next version of the hidden, then this, and then finally this. And you might ask, well, what, what is this structure you found? It turns out that Rice University has nine dormitories, and the most dominant structure in Facebook is what dorm you live in. <laughs> uh, and then you might want to look at the hidden structure. Uh, this is the first version of the hidden structure, a uh, little bit better version, better version, better version. And now you notice that there are four clusters, and it determines what year you are, whether you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. Uh, you'll notice there are two other uh, very small clusters. Uh, I guess it's my th right here. Uh, I think those are probably students who didn't graduate in four years or, 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 or something. Uh, but it turns out that we actually found four levels of structure. Uh, it's just we don't know what the next two levels correspond to. Uh, it may be sports, people who like to play tennis or people who like to golf. Or, or it may be people who like particular shows or, or something. Uh, but it's this hidden structure that you're really interested in. Because as I mentioned earlier, if terrorists were using Facebook to communicate, it would be a very weak structure, but you would like to be able to, to pull it out. Um, I'm going to go, oh, I want to get back. It's this, this one. So I'm going to go on to another topic, uh, machine learning. Uh, in machine learning, uh, we have something that's called a threshold logic unit. Uh, it's a gate, it has a number of inputs, and each input has a weight, and the unit multiplies the input times the weight and sums it up, and if it's greater than a threshold, it outputs a one, if it's less than a threshold, it outputs a zero. And there's a way to train this network uh, what you do is you, um, you have a set of inputs, A1 up to AN, that you want to classify, and you have labels for each one, whether it should have a plus one output or a negative output, and you start by setting the weight vector equal to the first pattern, and then you cycle through all of the patterns, and whenever a pattern is misclassified, you add the pattern or subtract the pattern, depending on whether you want a positive or negative output, to the weight vector. And if the data is linearly separable, this algorithm will converge and find a, a solution. But what's important, and what I want you to remember, is that the weight vector is a linear combination of the patterns. Uh, the reason for that is you start out by setting the weight vector equal to a pattern, and every time you modify the weight vector, you do it by adding or subtracting a pattern. So at the end, the weight vector is a linear combination of, of the patterns. And if the data is linearly separable, you'll, you'll quickly separate it. But what happens if the data is not linearly separable? Uh, if it's not linearly separable, maybe what you want to do is map it to a higher dimension where it is linearly separable. And here, here's an example. Uh, you want to separate the x's from the zeros. And there's no way in this two dimensions that there's a straight line that separates them. But if you add another coordinate z, which is the square of the distance of points from the origin, you will pull the circles further out from the plane than the x's. And you can easily separate them by a plane parallel to the surface here. Uh, the reason this is important uh, is that uh, this is the basis of what's called a support vector machine. 
And uh, the mapping that you may use uh, may be to a much higher dimension, but the important thing is you don't need to actually compute this mapping. Uh, all that you really need is to know what the products of mappings are. So this function f up here may be very complex, but I never have to uh, compute it to run this algorithm. And I'll just show you why that's true. Uh, the weight vector is going to be a linear combination of these mappings. And when I multiply uh, the image of a mapping times the weight vector, all I need is products. I don't actually need to know what f is. All I know, need to know is what f of ai and times f of aj is. And when I update the weight vector, it's easy to do because if I'm going to add this to the weight vector, I just have to change the coordinate. I add one or subtract one from the coordinate. Okay, so what you want to do is introduce the notion of what's called a kernel. And a kernel is just a matrix whose elements is the product of the images of the uh, mappings of the images. And you might think, well, could I just use any matrix I want? Well, you better make sure that the matrix corresponds to some function. And that will be true if and only if the matrix is positive uh, semi-definite. So that there are a number of kernels that you can use. Uh, one of them is the Gaussian kernel. It's a particularly effective one. If you want to merge two mailing lists and you want to remove duplicates and you have this problem that someone might have had their first name John in one list, but in another list just an initial J period. Uh, or they might have spelled out street or abbreviated street. Uh, and if you use the Gaussian kernel, it turns out it's very simple to find out which, which addresses are, are really equivalent, even though they're not the same. Uh, and this, this is, uh, there, there are many other kernels besides the Gaussian kernel, and you can just look up an appropriate one for your, for your problems. But this is the essence of support vector machines. Uh, which now, at least in the United States, if you buy any sophisticated product, it has a support vector machine in. Uh, it's, it's easier to learn what to do than for someone to program it to, to know what to do. But the next advance is really going to be in the area of deep learning, and that's, that's what I want to talk about. So in deep learning, you have a network of these threshold logic units. And just to give you an idea of the order of size, uh, there are millions of threshold logic units, and the number of weights which you get to adjust are in the order of the billions. So you, you can wonder, how am I going to do a gradient descent algorithm and get it to converge when I have a billion parameters to adjust? Well, one of the things that makes this deep learning important is in the past, what we did is we trained a network using some known data which was already labeled. So, so imagine if you wanted to uh, put in a search that said, I would like a photograph of a cat sitting on a beach watching the sunset. In the past, what you would have had to have done is labeled maybe 10,000 photographs, trained a support vector machine on those, and then hoped you would get the right answer. Uh, but look at the amount of labeling you'd have to do because that photograph with the cat sitting on the beach, there's, you'd have to label not only a beach, a cat, a sunset. You don't know what kind of question is going to be asked. And so you would like to have a way that you did not have to train the network. And it turns out that when people have started to work with these deep networks, they looked and said, well, what does this gate learn? And they noticed that there was a gate that learned that it was photographs of cats. And nobody ever told it what a cat was. But it turns out that what you're finding is a better uh, representations of the photographs than the photographs themselves. And you sort of uh, uh, inadvertently are organizing them according to, to nice ways. But some, one of the things you have to do in order to train a network is you have to have an error function you're going to reduce. 
and the error function needs to be differentiable. So they don't use the threshold, uh, they use a sigmod function, uh, and in fact, they actually use something much simpler than that because, uh, but it, I, I don't want to go into the details, but uh, look at it. And you've got to worry about convergence time. And you've got to also realize people are working with networks where the number of levels is a thousand deep. And so the question is, how do you train these? And there's some very sophisticated ways to do that, uh, which are kind of exciting. So I'm, I'm going to go back here and show you one way to, to encode one of these networks. It's, it's not the way people actually do it, but it's, it's the way students often, often do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put uh, an image in here. And then what I'm going to do is try to train all of the weights in here so that I get the image out. So notice that I didn't have to label any data. I'm training this network. Uh, by showing it images and trying to reproduce the images. And you'll notice that inside here, there's many fewer gates than the number of bits. And, but you can still represent the, the, the photos because the number of photos that you're trying to represent is, is relatively small. It may only be 10 to the 8, 100 million. And if, if even if these uh, gates in here, if there were a thousand of them, even if they were binary, you'd have two to the thousand codes, which is far exceeds the number of images you'll ever, ever have. Okay, so the way you might train this, though, is you might shorten the network and just train the first level of hidden gates. Once you get the first level trained, you might freeze the gates here, the weights here, and train a, a second level. When you get the second level trained, uh, then what you would do is freeze two levels of weights, do the next level, and so on, until you get the entire network trained. Uh, it's not a particularly good way to do this, but if you're just uh, dealing with a fairly small network, th this is a relatively good way to do it. Um, what I want to do is just talk about some of the research problems that this opens up. Uh, question is, what do individual gates learn? How, how do what they learn vary over time? Uh, in watching one network, uh, a student noticed that three gates decided to learn how large is the picture. And for a number of steps, first hundred steps, the three of them were working very hard on that. And then all of a sudden, two of them gave up and decided to learn something else, and just one gate continued to learn size. And the question is, is how did those two gates understand that somebody else was doing a better job and they should give up? Th these are kind of exciting research questions that, that come up today. Uh, one of the things, if you're using images, uh, and you use a different sort of different kind of network, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, the first few levels just learn things about images, but not about the specific images you're training the network on. Uh, and so you can just use these first three levels for any set of images and they'll work well. Uh, they, they learn things like how do you determine if there's an edge or a corner, something like that. Uh, but when you're dealing with photographs, uh, you use something that, that, that's called, for the first few levels, there's called a convolution network. And what you have is you have a small window, say a three by three window, which you're going to slide over the entire uh, image. And you'll have sort of nine weights coming to a gate. And these weights for all of these uh, gates here that, that use that window as it slid around are going to be tied together so they'll be the same. Uh, those gates are going to learn something they will maybe decide they want to learn if something is an edge. But you want to learn many different features, so there'll be many different sets of gates like this. In fact, there's typically 100 different sets, and each of them will be uh, discovering how to learn some other property of the, of the photograph. And uh, then you put the network together, uh, you have this convolution level, uh, then to reduce the number of gates somewhat, they have a, a pooling level where they have typically a, a two by two window and they just t collapse it into one gate 
which takes the maximum value or the average value. And if you were finding a feature, it isn't important exactly where that feature is, but just the relationship of various copies of, of that feature and, and other features. So, so a typical network early on looked like this. Uh, there are a number of these convolution levels, and then there is a number of fully connected levels, and then something called softmax, which actually converts it to the output that, that, that you want. So I'm going to show you uh, uh, an experiment that we did, uh, but I'm going to back up for a second because I need a piece of terminology. Uh, if this is a trained network, you put in an image here, you're going to get an activation vector over here. And I'm going to talk about that activation vector. Uh, because what we did is we put in an image of Bush, and we found the activation vector. Then what we did is we decided we were going to change Bush's age. And so we took 2,000 images of older people, and we found the manifold of their activation vectors. And we moved the activation vector for Bush to the, to the manifold of older people. And then we took that activation vector and reconstructed the image. And what we got is we just got Bush as he was a little older. And what this allows you to do is to explore about learning. Because there are many different aspects of an image and you can start manipulating these aspects. Some other researchers did the following thing. They took a piece of artwork, they found the activation vector, and then what they did is they changed the artistic style. They took a number of pieces of artwork of another artist and said, what would this image look like if we changed the style? And these were a couple of pictures that, that they got. And the only reason I'm showing you this is I just wanted to show you, you know, just how exciting and interesting the things that people are doing today are. And we really have to understand and, and make some progress. I'm going to talk about spectral clustering. I'll just, just check the time because I, I put together a lot of slides and when the time runs out, I'm just going to quit. Uh, but, but in spectral clustering, uh, what you do is you have an adjacency matrix, and I made some perfect clusters where there's no edges in between. And if you take the adjacency matrix and you find the first three singular vectors, uh, they will correspond to these clusters. And what you do is you take the, the rows of this three by three matrix and map them to three dimensional space. And what will happen is they will get mapped to three points. Now, if I had not made such perfect data, if there had been a fewer edges in the clusters and some edges between clusters, what you would have gotten was a scattering of points, but you could use k-means clustering to pull out the, the uh, clusters. Now, what I'm showing you is what would, I would call global clustering. Because if you start it with a graph with a billion vertices and you clustered it, you would probably end up with clusters of size 300 million. And I'm not sure that that's what you want. If you see three people wandering down the street and you want to know what cluster are they in, you probably want to know a cluster of size 50, not of 300 million. So how do we modify this procedure so that we get small clusters? And I'm going to illustrate this. I'm going to skip over some slides which are uh, just technical uh, to hear. And, and by the way, I think the slides are going to be put on a web somewhere if you, if you want, to, want to look at them. They're, they'll be available. But uh, suppose you had three ponds of water that were connected by narrow isthmus. And you dropped a little dye into one of the ponds. And you watched what happened over time. That dye would spread out a little. And pretty soon, it would be uniform on, the, cluster, on the, 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 the water that you put it in, the pond. And some of it would have leaked out to the rest. And then eventually, it would converge on the entire uh, water system. Now, the reason I show this is the way you calculate 
uh, singular vectors is you do a random walk on the graph and you walk until the probability of where the walk is reaches the stationary distribution. But imagine if you stopped the walk after one or two steps, after it only had time to converge on the cluster of size 50, rather than on the entire graph. Then you could use spectral clustering to find, pull out these small clusters. And I'm just, I, I just find this interesting uh, the details, the technical details, I don't think are so interesting. That I'm just going to show you something else that kind of excites me. And this, this actually came, originally came, a lot of things came from physics that computer science is just now uh, using. But here is a problem a doctor has. He has a graph with about 100 vertices. And when you go in, He's going to label some of these vertices, like, have you been in a country where there's a particular disease? Uh, were you particularly tired? Did you eat some food which maybe was old? Something like that. And then he's going to look at your symptoms. And from these, he wants to estimate what's the most likely disease or what's the probability you have a certain disease. Okay, now, uh, the way he does this is the following. Uh, he has a vector uh, whose coordinates correspond to the 100 vertices in that previous slide. And let's say um, each of these coordinates could take on one of two values. Then the possible values for x is 2 to the 100. And to give you a feeling for how large that is, uh, the number of atoms in the visible universe is only two to the, is 10 to the 70th. So this is more than the atoms in the visible universe. Okay. And what he wants to do is he wants to compute maybe the expected value of some function. And the way you would do that is you would multiply the value of the function times the probability for each value of x and sum over the, this 2 to the 100 values. Now, obviously, you can't do that. So what you're going to do instead is you're going to sample. But what you have to sample is you have to sample according to the probability p of x. And how do you do that? And the way you do it uh, is, is the following. And there's a slight error in my graph, in my slide. I say construct a graph. Uh, you're you're going to just think about the graph. You're not going to actually construct it. Uh, where the vertices uh, correspond to the values of x, and you're going to assign probabilities to the edges so that the stationary probability of a random walk is p of x. Then what you're going to do is a random walk on this graph until the walk converges to the stationary probability, and then that's going to be your sample value. Then you're going to walk some more till you're statistically independent from that value and take another sample, and so on. Now, in your mind, you're going to say, hey, wait a minute. If that graph has 2 to the 100 vertices, how am I going to store it in the computer? And what is interesting is you don't have to store it in the computer to do a random walk. All you need to do is store one vertex and have an algorithm which will generate the adjacent vertices. And so the graph is actually has a very tiny representation. But uh, the, the next question that comes up is how long do you have to walk on this graph uh, until you reach the, a stationary probability. Uh, if this graph has two to the hundred vertices, you might think that's going to be a long time walking. But it turns out that if you construct the graph so it's an expander, the time it takes to converge is only logarithmic in the number of vertices, and so you only have to take on the order of a hundred steps. And that's why this works. Uh, it, it always kind of excites students when I tell them that they're going to do a random walk on a graph that they can't even store in a computer. But I'm, I'm going to show you a, another thing where something is very large, uh, because in the next century we're going to be dealing with large items and how to store something which is large in much less space than you believe. So there's a particular algorithm here. Um, I, I have a, a stream of data, and may, maybe these are credit cards. They're all purchases from some company. 
And I want to know if some credit card is appearing an unusual number of times. But these credit card numbers can be any number from 1 to M. And a credit card a number is 16 digits long. So the number of possible numbers is 10 to the 16. Uh, 10 to the 9 is a billion. And so this is 10 million billions, just to give you an idea. Uh, and what I'm going to let, if f of s is the number of occurrences of symbol s, and I want to calculate the variance of the stream, and the way I do that is I calculate f of s squared for each symbol and sum them up. And that's going to take m counters. That's this number, uh, you're going to have 100 million streams of a billion counters in the computer. That's obviously not going to work. Uh, so how, how, do, how do we do this? Well, what I'm going to do instead is I'm not going to give you an exact answer. I'm just going to give you a very good approximation. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to generate a, a vector, x, where each, it's of dimension m, where each coordinate is plus or minus 1 with probability a half. And out of this set of vectors, I'm going to select one at random. And what I'm going to compute instead is xs times fs summed s equal 1 to m. But I can do this with one counter. Uh, the reason I can do it with one counter is I'm combining the counts together. It's just each count is multiplied times a random variable. And the first thing you'll notice is the expected value of A, uh, where the expected value is taken over the choice of your random x, is zero. But, but sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. If you square it, it's always positive, and the expected value of the square is a very good estimate of the answer. Now, the reason I put this up, I don't want to go into the math of it, but you're going to ask, but how are you going to store this random vector x, which is of length uh, 10 to the 16th? Well, it turns out that most random computer programs, you don't need full randomness. You only need pseudo-randomness. Uh, if I really had to make it completely random, and that would mean you would pick an x, any one of 2 to the m x's, and no matter how you uh, assign names to these, you would need 2 to the m names, and you couldn't possibly do it in less than m bits. However, if you only need pseudo-randomness, uh, you can pick an x, and you can generate that x from a fully random vector, which is of length only log m. And that allows you to store this random vector in log of its length rather than its length. Uh, and, and in this particular algorithm, you need four-way independence, but uh, that's, that's not that important. Um, so uh, one of the things that we're going to do in the next decade is we're going to digitize many uh, sets of records. And one of them is medical records. And I would like it so that if I became ill here in Rio, uh, one of your doctors could download my entire medical history and give me the best possible medical uh, treatment. But I'm not sure that I want my insurance company to know exactly what was wrong with me. And in fact, the insurance company doesn't need to know. All they need is a rigorous mathematical proof that they owe a doctor a certain amount of money, and they don't even ha have to know who the patient was. But we also want to let researchers have access to these digital records. And we don't want to let them have any access to personal information, but we want to let them calculate statistical things so that they uh, can uh, develop better uh, methods for treatment. And there's starting to be some work, theoretical work, that's going to allow us to do this. Uh, part of it might be zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, another area is differential privacy. And I thought maybe you haven't seen a zero-knowledge proof, so I'll show you a couple. Uh, a zero-knowledge proof is, is a proof that a theorem is true without giving you any other information. 
so uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, here is a Sudoku game. And what I want to do is I want to prove to you that I know how to complete this game correctly without giving you any information as to how to do it. Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write the solution down on pieces of cardboard and put the pieces of cardboard down on the appropriate squares face down. And now you're going to say, well, how do I know it's a solution? And I'll say, well, you can check any row, column, or, or square that you want. And so you pick the first row, and I pick up the pieces of cardboard, shuffle them, and show them to you, and you see that I have the first row correct. And then I put them back. And then you say, let me see the second row. And I pick up those pieces, shuffle them, show them to you. And after you go through all the rows, columns, and three by three squares, you might think I have a solution. But you don't know that I put the pieces of cardboard back in the same order they were when I picked them up. So it's not completely sure. But if I don't have a solution and you repeat and ask the, each row a fair number of times in each column and so forth, you can re, if, if I have an error, you will discover it with probability one, okay? But I haven't given you any information whatsoever about the solution. Now, how would you do this for a more complicated problem? So let, let's say we're dealing with graph coloring. Uh, and I'm in the business of coloring graphs with three colors so that no two adjacent vertices are the same color. And you have this graph with 100 million vertices and you want it colored. But the reason we have trouble doing business is I don't want to show you the coloring until you pay me and you don't want to pay me until you're sure I have a coloring. So what do we do? I give you a rigorous proof that I have a coloring. And the way it works in this case is I take colored pieces of cardboard and put them in envelopes where there's one envelope for each vertex. And then I say, go ahead and check, uh, and you pick an edge, and I give you the two envelopes for that, the endpoints of that edge, and you check and make sure they're different colors. At that point, I have not given you any information about the coloring, because if I had a coloring, I could permute the colors so that those two vertices were whichever two colors I wanted. But you're gonna wanna see another edge. And the minute I let you see another edge, I've given you a small bit of information, and I don't wanna do that. So what do we do? I pick up all the envelopes and burn them, and start over again, but I randomly permute the coloring of my graph. So now when you see another edge, you don't get any additional information. Now you might say, wait a minute, this is gonna take a long time and it's gonna be a lot of paper. Well, we, what we really do is we use an encryption system. We agree on an encryption system. And when you ask to see the, the colors of two vertices, I give you the encryption code. And so our computers are actually talking back and forth and we, we can do a, a, a test every minute Every, se every millionth of a second. We can do a million per second. So very quickly, if, if I don't have a coloring, you're going to discover my error, and uh, that's how it works. Uh, but it's, it's not only uh, uh, graphs. Uh, there are many places uh, where we want privacy, and, uh, and I'll give you one more uh, having to do with cars. And just very quickly, uh, I quickly drive from Ithaca to Philadelphia, and I have to get on an interstate highway, and the route guidance system in my car gives me a route. That's the light red line coming down there. But I quickly noticed that other people were going a different way, and then noticed even a shorter way. And why didn't my route guidance system give me the best route? Well, they always kept me on major roads because they didn't know the condition of back roads. But uh, you may not be aware of it, but at least in the United States, your car recovers, stores uh, the digital coordinates of wherever you go, and you can play back where you've been for the last month. And when you take your car in for servicing, why don't they download the, the coordinates and they could use that to find the best routing, what local people are doing, and this, is, this could be big business, because if you could improve gas mileage 1%, you're talking about billions of dollars. But I'm not sure I want to share my GPS coordinates 
because they could look and figure out who I was by where I parked my car at night, where I worked, where I shopped, and some other things I might not want to let them know about. Um, so this is, I just wanted to just give you an example. Uh, but you're gonna deal with, with high dimensional data. And high dimensional data is uh, basically unstable. If you generate endpoints at random, uh, the n squared distances between the points will all be the same. Uh, the reason from that, for that follows from the law of large numbers. If you calculate the distance between two points, you're going to sum up the square of the distances between their coordinates, and you're summing a large number of random variables, and the law of large numbers says the answer is going to be close to the expected value. Uh, but, well, I, I guess I should show you one other thing about high dimensions. Uh, if you take a, a, unit, a, vol, a unit cube in any number of dimensions, its volume is always one. But if you have a unit radius sphere, as the dimension goes to infinity, the volume goes to zero. And that has uh, interesting applications. If, if you generate a Gaussian vector, its length is going to be square root d. And it's going to lie on the surface of a, of a sphere of radius square root d. Now, notice that the Gaussian probability distribution has its maximum value at the origin and then drops off exponentially fast. And the fact that there are no points in here, how can that be if you're, because if you integrate the probability distribution, you ought to get a value. The reason you get value zero is there's no volume there. Uh, so you don't get a, any points till you get out to the surface out here. Uh, if you generate two points, uh, you'll find out that these two points are orthogonal, because if you calculate the distance between them, it's square root 2d, whereas the distance to each point is square root d, so it's a right triangle. Now, notice uh, this point has to be on the equator. Why is that? Well, it's because all the surface of a high-dimensional sphere is at the equator. It's not like a three-dimensional sphere where there's a lot of area up at the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, but what's funny is you could have picked the North Pole anywhere you wanted, and that would have defined a different equator, and the point will be on the equator no matter whereabouts you put it. Uh, and that's just to let you know there's strange things in high dimension. Uh, since uh, high dimensions is unstable, why don't you project your data down to lower dimension? Um, one way to do that, uh, if you pick a random uh, subspace, all the distances will shrink by essentially the same amount. And so if you're going to run an algorithm uh, which depends only on relative size of distances, like clustering, rather than cluster in a million dimensions, cluster in a hundred dimensions, and your program will run 10,000 times faster. Um, I, I see that I'm running out of time. Um, so let me just skip uh, this. Uh, what, what I hope that I got across here, uh, first is computer science is undergoing a fundamental change. Uh, in the early years, we were interested in making computers useful. Now we're interested in what they're being used for. And there's just exciting research going on. And the reason I showed you these things is these, I find these exciting, and there's thousands of things like this to explore. But the one point I'd like you to walk away with is those individuals, institutions, and nations who position themselves for the future will benefit enormously. Thank you. OK. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. If, uh, have one. Yes, up there, please. Thank you. Good morning. I, I want to ask you, you, at the beginning of your talk, you said that <clears throat> the future is in the biological sciences. And then I want to come back to the example that you gave of a doctor asking where a person's been and what he or she has eaten and this sort of thing and how complicated that actually is in a mathematical model. But the doctor's brain most of the time can come up with a reasonable diagnosis of what the problem is. So trying to connect those two things, 
what is computer science now learning from the neurosciences that allow the, our understanding of how the brain processes that kind of information in a relatively straightforward way? Uh, that, that, that's a very good question. Um, I, I don't think we're to the point yet that we really understand how the brain processes. But one of the things that's, that is exciting about deep learning is it may give us some insight in, into how things are processed. Because what we have done is, is we've discovered what things can be learned and what can't. Uh, and so there are, there are things like that. Uh, but there are many ways that we interact with the biological sciences. Uh, one, one of the areas is in compressed sensing. And un unfortunately, I, I didn't give you that example. But um, so, suppose you had an orchard uh, with trees in it, apple trees, and you wanted a better apple. And what you would form is a matrix where each row corresponded to a tree and the columns corresponded to positions on the genome and you'd have some observable property and you'd want to solve a set of linear equations. But there are many more columns and rows and so there's a whole vector space of solutions. But you know that there's only one uh, sparse solution because evolution is thrifty. They wouldn't have two sets of genes doing the same thing. And so what we've done is we've studied the mathematical properties for when will a matrix have only one sparse solution. And there's just many ways like this that we're interacting with the biological sciences. But, um, and I didn't want to, since I don't know biology, uh, clearly biology is going to be one of the major sciences in the next century. It's, it's going to change our lives, it's going to change our economies, it's going to change, it's going to have all the exciting things that are going on in computer science. Any more? Yes. Uh, Professor Hopcroft, uh, please allow me to, to ask the same question I asked you yesterday when you, you were very generous and uh, kind to give us a, an inspiring uh, talk at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro when you talk to our students. So Professor Hopcroft, what is a modern hard problem? What is a modern easy problem when we try to study the limits of computation? Well, maybe graph coloring won't be a hard modern problem. Well, please, Professor. Yeah, uh, th th this is truly an e excellent question, and, and I should have thought of it uh, <laughs> a little last night and give, be, be able to give you a better answer. <laughs> Because uh, I, I, I still don't, I, I don't have a, a good answer to it. So I'll, I'll sort of somewhat repeat what I, what I said yesterday. Um, one of the things that, and I was talking to students then, so I said one of the things I told students is, you know, if you pick a problem that many really bright people have worked on for the past 30 years, uh, it's going to be hard and you're not likely to make progress. Uh, a much better thing to do is to pick a new area that people haven't explored where the problems are very simple, very important, and fun to work on. Uh, and so pick an easy problem. And, and it sort of goes with the, the point that I wanted to make uh, for, for young students. And for those, those of you that teach, uh, uh, students, their careers are going to be different than that of the faculty of my age. And a, a student should not work on the things that I worked on in my career. Many of them come to me, and since I tend to be an expert in certain areas, they want to work on this area. And, and I tell them that's a mistake. What we ought to do is find the area that's going to be exciting during the next 30 years in their career. Uh, the, other, the other thing I tell them is, you know, if, if you graduate from a, from a university, you're going to earn enough salary that money should not be a driving factor in the job you pick. Uh, your, your job is going to be a big piece of your life. And if you want it to be successful, you want to pick something that excites you and is fun for you. You want to make sure that when you go to work in the morning, you get up and say, boy, I'm going to work on this exciting problem. 
And it, that's true even if you're not doing research, because very many of our, very few of our students are going to end up at research organizations. But even if you're in development, if, if you're developing something that is really exciting and you want to share with the world, your, your life will be much more pleasant than otherwise. Yeah. I, I, I'm a physicist and I, I noticed that one particular piece of pie in the sky that you didn't mention was quantum computing. Would you care to give us your perspective on what that might do to us? Right, uh, so, so quantum computing is a very interesting area and it's an area that I'm not that knowledgeable in. But one of my former PhD students, uh, it turns out to be a leading researcher in that area. So I sort of asked him a version of your question uh, and I'll give you his answer. Uh, I, I actually, what I did is I asked him, are we going to have a quantum computer? And he said, no, that's highly unlikely. And th so I said, why, why are you devoting your career then to quantum computing? It doesn't make sense to me. And he said, John, I believe that what we're going to learn from quantum computing is going to allow us to make a fundamental contribution to physics. Now, whether he's, he's right or not, I, I, I don't know. But as I talk to other people in quantum computing, uh, this, this seems to be their driving, the thing that's driving them. Uh, not that they really think that there's going to be a computer. We only have one more question, and Professor Edmundo was raising his hand many <laughs> times, so Professor Edmundo has the word. If someone else wants to talk, uh, no problem. <laughs> uh, sometimes when you face with a real problem, like for clustering or for uh, a finer pattern, you don't know what's the best or the algorithms you, you want to use to attack the problem. Could you comment then what would do in that sense? Uh, do you start simple with simple algorithms or there is any one of your choice? Right, that's a good question because I, I think it, it leads to something, has there been a change in, in science? Uh, during my career, I knew what algorithm to use because the problems were relatively simple, they were mathematical, and uh, there was a way of determining what was the best algorithm. But the problems running in today, uh, they're so large and various features of them that nobody knows what's the best. And it's really experimentation that, that solves it. And I, let me comment on another aspect of, of science because during my career, uh, it was individual scientists working on simple problems who made fundamental contributions. But the problems now have become so much more complex. And particularly for computer science, as we're starting to build relations with other disciplines, like biology or something, uh, it really requires a small team. And I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there's really a change taking place, but it's something to think about. Um, is, is science changing so there's going to be a lot fewer contributions due to single individuals? and the contributions are going to be due to, to small teams of three or four people and possibly in different disciplines. Uh, at least it's something to think about. I, I, I don't know whether it's, that's right or not, but yeah. Uh, Professor Hopcroft, great honor to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>